Harry Reid was framed. Boom, right there. The first words out of his mouth, he can literally just sit down after this. He is telling them what is going to happen. That's confidence. Look at him gripping that desk with his arms. Look at it, look at his hands, that confident stance that he's got going on there. I mean, it's just perfect. Notice the man in the back, by the way, scratching his head, because that, I believe, is John O'Keefe's father, and he knows what's coming. He knows what David is about to say. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to your favorite show on the internet, Raw Law Unfiltered, with your favorite host, the DUI Guy Plus. Today, we are going to be starting a new series where I'm going to be covering famous cross-examinations, famous opening statements, famous closing arguments by plaintiffs, prosecutors, defense, depending on the case. Today, we're going to start out with a case that is fresh off the plate. Today, Karen reads opening statements by David Yannetti. Now, Contrast that with David Lally, a terrible, terrible, terrible prosecutor who, who had a very disjointed argument, a very watery, just kind of like a very malleable, like a, like a shmata, as we like to say in Yiddish. He's just like a little rag that, that has absolutely no purpose, no reason, no rhyme, no nothing. And compare that with Mr. David Yannetti, who gives a very powerful opening statement. Let's watch. Karen Reed was framed. Boom, right there, right out of the gate. The first words out of his mouth, forget everything the prosecution said, the 45 minutes that were up here mean absolutely nothing because why? They're accusing her, she was framed. That's all you need to know. That is the theme of the case. You have to start strong. You have to capture the attention of your audience. You have to grip them. You have to grab them. You have to drag them down with you. And that is exactly what he's doing. It's such a powerful statement. Karen Reed was framed. He can literally just sit down and, and they know everything about the case. How crazy is that? That is called having a theme in your case. That is the theme of the defense's case. Now he's about to extrapolate on it. You're going to see it. It's like a flower that is opening up and, 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 and speed, it, speed it up motion. Listen to what David Yannetti says, how he continues. Her car never struck John O'Keefe. Never struck. She did not cause his death. She didn't cause his death. And that means that somebody else did. Somebody else did. She was framed. You will learn that it was no accident that John was accident. found dead on the front lawn of 34 Fairview Road in Kent on January 29th of 2022. You will learn that at that address lived a well-known and well-connected law enforcement connected family. Connected family lives right there. Kent. The Alberts. The Alberts. Because the Alberts were involved. Because they were and involved. because they had close connections to the investigators in this case, Karen Reed was framed for a murder she did not commit. Restating the theme. Started with the theme, point one, point two, point three, restating the theme. Now watch what he does next. Good morning again, Good morning. ladies and gentlemen. As now I he's really you. beginning to talk about him. I am David Yannetti, I'm with firm so-and-so. Because none of that is relevant. You first want to hook your audience. Now they're captivated. They can't look away. They can't stop watching. They can't stop listening. They are hooked. They are drawn to David. They want to listen to what he has to say. And look at his posture. Look at him gripping that desk with his arms look at it look at his hands that confident stance that he's got going on there i mean it's just perfect it's a master class in how to do an opening statement in a defense murder case when you're defending an alleged murderer and the, the the facts are that she didn't do it they got the wrong person for those of you who are not familiar with the case it was the police who killed him they beat him up and they accidentally i believe they accidentally killed him they didn't mean to they screwed up they're like oh shoot I think they wanted to scare him and they killed him. And now they're trying to put it on Karen. Let David tell the story. Listen. My name is David Yannetti. I'm an attorney with an office in Boston. Together with attorneys Alan Jackson and Elizabeth Little, it's truly my privilege and my honor to represent Karen Reed during this trial. From the very early... So he's starting with the introductions who I am, where I'm from, what I'm doing. Uh, after he has stated his theme, 
and all the points that the jurors are going to question. He gave them a summary of the entire case in about 60 seconds. That's called an elevator opening or an elevator speech type opening. He can literally just sit down after this, but he's not going to because he wants to give them more, obviously. But the point is made. His entire case was stated for Karen Reed was framed. Then he extrapolated the points, and now he's talking about who he is, what he is, and why he's there. From a very early juncture in this case, you will question the Commonwealth's theory of the case. He is not asking them what I want you to do. He is telling them what is going to happen. That's confidence. You will question the quality of the Commonwealth's evidence. You will question the veracity of the Commonwealth's witnesses. And you will question their shoddy and biased investigation, a faulty investigation that led to Karen Reed sitting here today. You will learn, in short, that the police did no real investigation of this case, and you will question why. You'll question why the investigators had such tunnel vision. Look at his furrowed eyebrows. I am questioning it, and you will question it as well. You can feel David's emotion. You can feel Mr. Yanetti's feelings as he's telling Karen Reed's story. You'll question why they focused solely on Karen Reed, mm. someone with no ties to the Canton Police Department, as opposed to the well-known and well-connected Albert family of Kim, family that was never treated as suspects by the investigators in this case. Boston police officer John O'Keefe was found mortally injured on Brian Albert's front lawn. His body was in full view and almost right below Brian Albert's bedroom window on his front lawn. He was found wearing only one sneaker. And that's important. He was found wearing only one sneaker because if she was framed by the people in the house, it's very possible that his shoe fell off. They didn't notice and the shoe got lost somewhere in the house. Who goes outside with one shoe? Hmm. That is very important. You'll learn that Brian Albert was a Boston police officer as well and that he was a trained first responder. That's very important. Brian Albert was notified that another police officer was injured and unresponsive on his front lawn. And Brian Albert did nothing. Did nothing. Sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, and other civilians were on his property that morning after John O'Keefe's body was found. Police, EMTs, firefighters, police cruisers, and an ambulance, fire truck, lights flashing. And first responder, Brian Albert, never came out of his house. Look at that. All of this stuff happening outside, all of this commotion, all of this stuff, and Brian Albert never came out of his house. He's painting, it's like a Rembrandt with a tongue. You know, he's just painting this. I see the ambulances, I see the fire trucks, I see the first responders. Oh, Brian Albert, he's a first responder. So he's gonna be coming outside. He is gonna talk to the, no. Listen to the gravity of those words, how powerful they are. You can almost hear him. He whispered them because he doesn't need to add any shock value to them. They are already shock valued words. Very fascinating. Equally important for you will be the fact that the lead homicide investigators never went inside the Albert home that You'll learn that Brian Albert's brother, Kevin Albert, is a Canton police officer. It was obvious very early on that the Canton police should not be investigating the death of a man found on the property of the brother of a Canton police officer. Exactly. So it was decided just about from the start that the Massachusetts State Police should take complete control of this investigation because the Canton police were conflicted out. Now, that sounded good at the time. But you'll learn that two major problems arose. First, despite the fact that they obviously had a conflict of interest, the evidence will show that the Canton police still had their hands in this investigation. Notice how he is telling them what will happen. He's painting 
a story from start to finish. He's going in a very smooth chronological order. His storytelling ability is absolutely staggering. Unbelievable. Let's keep watching. You will find it astounding. Astounding. The but Kevin police officer Kevin Albert, the reason for the conflict of interest in the first place, was continually updated about the status of this investigation while it was going on. Why would that happen? Second, and equally troubling, is that the lead state, detect state police detective who was assigned to this case was a man named Michael Proctor. Michael Proctor. Michael Proctor, you will learn, is one of the many people in Canton with deep ties to the Albert family. Wait Michael a minute. Proctor. See what he's doing? He's trying to explain to them the main player, the man who investigated this crime, is tied into the family whose house in front of which John O'Keefe's body was found. I mean, if that doesn't give you the full picture of everything you need to know, if everybody on that jury is not scratching their heads right now, somebody needs to get the wax out of their ears. That is exactly what David is trying to get across, and he's doing a phenomenal job of it. His own mother refers to the Alberts as the Proctor's second family. Proctor's second family. At his own sister's wedding, Michael Proctor was in the wedding party with Colin Albert. And he sat at the head table of that wedding with members of the Albert family. That's the man who was chosen to lead the investigation into the suspicious death on the property of Brian Albert. That's the man who gave updates to Canton police officer Kevin Albert while the state police were supposed to be investigating what had occurred at his brother Brian Albert's house. You'll learn that right from the jump, Michael Proctor predetermined the outcome of this case. Never stepped foot inside the Albert home on January 29th, 2022. Never checked out whether there were any signs of strong... Now he's going through all the things that Proctor didn't do so the jury knows how biased he is and why. Inside that home, he never called for crime scene technicians and other specialists to look for blood or other trace evidence within the home. He never asked Brian Albert for permission to go in the home and take a look around. Michael Proctor never applied for a search warrant to go in that home. Instead, he focused immediately and exclusively on Karen Reed, the outsider. The outsider. Oh, you that's will. important. Why is Karen Reed getting the fault? She's an outsider. She's not family. She's not second family. She's an outsider. Let's go ahead and just pin it on her. Learn that no one in the Proctor family has ever called the Reed family their second family. No one in the Proctor family had been in a wedding party with anyone from the Reed family. Karen Reed was a convenient outsider. She was most definitely not from Canton. So how did Michael Proctor feel about her? How did he treat somebody he was investigating at a point in time when he should have been keeping an open mind and focusing on obtaining all possible evidence so that he didn't miss anything? Notice the man in the back, by the way, scratching his head, because that, I believe, is John O'Keefe's father, and he knows what's coming. He knows what David is about to say, and listen to what David says. What the lead investigator, who's supposed to keep an open mind about the potential suspects in John O'Keefe's death, here's what he says. Well, you will learn that on the very day that John O'Keefe was found dead on Brian Albert's lawn, Michael Proctor was texting with his high school buddies about this supposedly secret investigation. Using okay, so right, over, right out of the gate, he's texting his high school buddies about a secret, confidential, ongoing, open investigation into the death of a cop. Why is he talking to his high school buddies? That's already question number one. Let's see what's question number two. His personal cell phone. He was revealing information about this investigation to his friends, assuming that nobody would ever find out what he was doing and what he was saying. And he was revealing his true thoughts about Karen Reed to his friends, not what he put in his sanitized police reports. 
Not what he put in his sanit. I love that word. The sanitized police reports. He was revealing his true thoughts on his personal cell phone because they have the records. His true feelings. What were they? To his friends whom he trusted and in text messages that he never thought would come into the hands of the defense in this case. Lead investigator Trooper Michael Proctor, right from the start, called Karen Reed names you would reserve only for your worst enemies. He told his friends that he hoped that she would kill herself. Wow. And look at him just leaning in when he does that. He hopes that she would give herself. The day of John O'Keefe's murder, he, the lead investigator has already formed an idea in his mind. We're going to frame Karen Reed, and here's how we're going to do it. We're about to find out how. He told his friend that he had seized her cell phone. And you will learn that he knew he shouldn't have been accessing any content on her cell phone because he knew there would likely be attorney-client communications on between Karen and me at that time. He knew that he was supposed to wait for a search warrant or other permission from a judge in order to go through that phone. But you'll learn that he went through the phone anyway, without permission. And you'll know that he did because he told his high school buddies that he was searching her phone for nude photos of Karen Reed. And he was disappointed he hadn't found any yet. Wow. That is the professional and unbiased investigator who was chosen to lead Looking the investigation into the death of John O'Keefe. You'll learn that one of Michael Proctor's high school friends commented to him that with a dead body on the front lawn, the homeowner in this case is surely going to catch a lot of grief. And you know what Michael Proctor's response to that was? Listen. One word. Nope. Nope. And he explained why. Michael Proctor assured his buddies that the homeowner would not catch a lot of grief because, quote, the homeowner's a Boston cop, too. Uh -huh. End quote. Now we learn. That one sentence, ladies and gentlemen, Mike, in Michael Proctor's own words, will explain a lot to you about how this investigation was conducted. You will be able to evaluate whether Trooper Michael Proctor treated Brian Albert and his family differently because of who they are and their relationships between his family and theirs. You will evaluate whether this investigation was on the up and up. You will decide, as a result, how valuable or worthless, or worthless. the prosecution's DNA evidence is or is not so important. in light of who controlled that evidence. You will learn that Michael Proctor's fingerprints are figuratively all over this case. His fingerprints are all over the Commonwealth yes, evidence. His hand in the cookie jar. You will learn that Michael Proctor showed up at Karen Reed's parents' house in Dighton to interview her during the afternoon of January 29th, only hours after John O'Keefe's body was found dead on Brian Albert's front lawn. You'll learn that Michael Proctor had her Lexus SUV towed from her parents' home. But you'll also learn that he wrote a search warrant in which he falsified the time that he took that SUV. Oh, he's not falsifying evidence? He too? swore under Listen oath that. that the vehicle so wasn't power. towed until 5.30 p.m. So much power. But you'll learn that we obtained surveillance. Look, look at his chin. He's just like, you will also learn. It's the confidence. He's just oozing with confidence. Footage that he didn't know we would get. And that surveillance footage exposed that Michael Proctor's words in that sworn affidavit were a lie. Michael Proctor had that vehicle for about 90 minutes before he claimed to have taken. And folks, you will learn that the timing is important, very important. Because when John O'Keefe was first found on Brian Albert's front lawn, the police thoroughly searched that uh, yard for potential evidence. And it wasn't just one officer, or two, or three. There were at least four officers that searched that front lawn. And that morning was the beginning of a snowstorm, but there wasn't yet much snow on the ground when they were searching that lawn. 
It was light out by the time they did the search, and it was getting lighter. And during that thorough search of Brian Albert's front lawn, the number of pieces of tail light that were found by a minimum of four officers looking for evidence was zero. Zero. It was only later in the day when the snow was really starting to accumulate that the police miraculously started to find pieces of tail light on the property. The police only started to find pieces of tail light after Michael Proctor had seized Cameron Reed's car. They only started to find pieces of tail light after Michael Proctor had possession of her tail light. Very important fact. They only found the pieces of tail light after, not before, around the body, which would lead one to believe that they were planted. He didn't say the words planted, but they're implied, and that is way more powerful because now the jury gets to deduce that on their own. And the trooper Michael Proctor then kept going back to the Albert residence after that day, and he claims to have kept finding pieces of taillight on multiple occasions on multiple different days. And in addition, a good week after John O'Keefe's death, Canton Police Chief Kenneth Berkowitz an older officer on the brink of retirement with probably not the best eyesight. Someone, uh, he supposedly was driving, uh, happened to be driving past Brian Albert's house. And uh, by the way, Brian Albert is someone with whom, whom Chief Berkowitz is also good friends. And this older man allegedly spotted yet another piece of taillight from his moving vehicle. This was yet another piece of taillight that was somehow missed by the trained specialists who had previously and thoroughly searched the property. Another piece of taillight that Proctor supposedly missed in the many times he went back to the property. Um, crazy. And uh, Michael Proctor claims that he kept finding pieces of taillight right up until February 18th of 2022, which was nearly three weeks after John O'Keefe was found dead on Brian Albert's land. You will learn that there is no competent evidence that Karen Reed's taillight shattered More at Brian facts. Albert's property you will in learn. the early morning hours of January 29th of 2022. To the contrary, you'll learn that when Karen left John at Brian Albert's house, she drove back to John's house on Meadows Ave across town in Canton. At John's home, where he lived with his two adopted children, Karen was drifting in and out of sleep, but she woke up for good in a panic sometime around 4 a.m. because John hadn't come home, and that was not like him at all. He had never done that before. Karen had a sinking feeling that something was wrong. The sixth something sense. was seriously the implication no. that she is not the killer. So she got back into her Lexus. And she backed up out of the garage to leave the driveway. And when she did, the right rear taillight of her Lexus struck John's parked vehicle in the driveway and her taillight cracked. That was the same taillight that the prosecution now claims was broken outside the Albert residence hours earlier at 12.38. But we have video evidence that the taillight was actually broken at 5 a.m., many hours after the prosecution needs that taillight to have been broken. There is, of course, no video of the taillight being broken at Brian Albert's house. You will eventually conclude that that's because the taillight was not broken there. Importantly, you will learn that there was an eyewitness who arrived at 34 Fairview after Karen got there with John O'Keefe in the early morning hours of January 29th. And that eyewitness, Brian Nagel, who's the brother of Julie Nagel, who was at the after hours party that night. He had a clear view of Karen's SUV. Brian Nagel confirms that there was no damage to her taillight at that time. Karen was sitting in the driver's seat with her hands at 10 and two. And Ryan Nagel confirms that while Karen was inside the car. John O'Keefe was not. John O'Keefe was also not outside the car at that time. You will ultimately conclude there's only one other place he could have been. Now, going back to that 5 a.m. video from John's driveway, you will see Karen back up her Lexus and strike John's car 
at about 5 a.m. when she was leaving John's house to go out to look for him. And you will know that she struck his car at 5 a.m. because you will watch that video closely. You will watch that video closely because he is giving them an embedded command. You will know this fact because you will watch that video closely. He's telling the jurors the type of evidence he wants them to pay attention to because the headlight is pretty much the entirety of the Commonwealth's case. And you will see why it's so weak in a moment. Or actually, you will see it in the next video because I will continue this opening. We're breaking it up into two pieces. That is going to premiere tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern. So don't miss it. I will see you all. Thank you for tuning in to Raw Law Unfiltered with your favorite host, the DUI Guy Plus, your favorite show on the internet. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye, everybody.